All right. God bless you guys. So we are in the uh, the 21st week of ordinary time. Ooh, hold on. Twenty-first week of ordinary time. We are beginning in the book of Isaiah. Oh gosh, I think it's Isaiah. I can't remember what it is. We're in Isaiah twenty-two for a little bit, but just go to the book of Isaiah. Yep, Isaiah twenty-two. Woo woo. Isaiah twenty-two. Who wants to read for us? Isaiah 22, verses 19 through 23. Any takers on here? Go ahead. Verse 19. 19 to 23. I will thrust you from your altar, and you will be cast down from your station. In that day I will call my servant Elakim, the son of Hilkiah, and... I will clothe him with your robe, and you and will bind your belt on him, and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulders the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a sure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. Amen. So on that sheet that I gave you guys there, we're not going to read here first, you know, right now, but we just read, uh, what did we read? We read 19 to 23, and I got 15 to 25 on that sheet there. But uh, don't, don't read ahead yet. We're, we'll get to the sheet in a second. Um, if you guys need some more copies, we have some over here, too, if you want another one. Um, so one of the things that I, I've pointed out so often in the time is that, uh, is that how, how that first reading is so intricate, intricate, intricately woven with the gospel. And uh, anyway, if you read ahead to the readings at all this week, you'll, you'll be able to really tell that the gospel and this first reading are so, uh, so deeply and so beautifully interwoven together um, and so we're going to spend some time there on Isaiah so we'll come back to that that reading okay our second reading comes from St. Paul to the Romans Romans chapter 11 so we're Matthew Mark Luke and John the four gospels the book of Acts and then Romans Romans chapter 11 verse 33 Who wants to read it for us? Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 33 through 36. So despite the fact of uh, if you read ahead for the, the gospel readings at all, or if you read ahead with any of the readings, can you see any, any real uh, link between that second reading? So, spoiler effect, the, uh, the gospel is the, uh, the story of St. Peter with the keys. Uh, St. Peter in, uh, in, in, in telling Jesus, or Jesus asking who the Son of Man uh, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Do we see any link here at all? Well, in the first reading, yes. In the first reading, yes, definitely. How about that second reading? So we'll we'll see how it kind of plays out and how you know. I mean, you could find a link with anything, certainly, or or just any uh, any type of grab away. Um, but how inscrutable. Are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways? Just the fact that how how incredible it is and how beautiful it is that God has had a plan to redeem and bring back humanity from the very beginning. 
and how he uses his structure, how he's used his covenant, how he's used his, uh, his kingdom of Israel to redeem his people now. Uh, so, so his ways are uh, who knows the mind of the Lord, who ha- who's been his counselor. And we have a different translation to counselor. Who knows the mind of the Lord? Oh, that counselor? Okay. Okay, we're going to dive right into the gospel. Gospel according to St. Matthew, and it comes in chapter 16. Sixteen, verse thirteen. Sixteen, verse thirteen through twenty. We're all there. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, "Who do people say that the Son of Man is?" And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And I say to you, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatever, then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. So, uh, so I, I often sit down, you know, after, after all the Sunday Masses and depending on what my Sunday night looks like, I just want it to be quiet and you know, just kind of chill. And, uh, and so I typically like to read the, the Sunday readings for next week and just start to transition my mind immediately to next week. And, um, and, and so I, I did that this week. I can't remember what my Sunday night looked like, but um, I did started doing that this week and then into Monday, just really praying with these readings. And, and this is a gospel that we've heard, or I'm assuming we've all heard before. It's one of those gospels that's so, so common. It's very popular, especially in Catholic circles. We hear it on the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. We hear it, uh, I'm sure we hear it another time throughout the church's year. Um, probably on the church on the feast of St. John Lateran or something like that. Uh, and then probably elsewhere, you know, and so I, I, I try to, you know, try to uh, be creative in my, my thought and preaching and prayer and all of that. I want to be try I want to try to be creative. So I don't always want to preach the same thing. So I was really just kind of digging around and, and searching. And there's a lot on this gospel, <laughs> The church fathers have said a lot over 2,000 years, and there's a lot of scholarship on this. Um, and so I'm not too sure w- which avenue the Lord is really taking me to pray, one of two things, or uh, to preach on this week, but one of two things. But, uh, but so I'm ultimately stealing this Wednesday in the Word. I'm stealing it from Jeff Cavins. You guys know who he is. So he's done a lot on this also. So just stealing a lot of his stuff here. But again, to try to to try to take us in a direction that we're not so used to, okay. And of course, my my own little spin on it. Um, so Jesus, uh, Jesus starts off here with a question to his to his to his his apostles. So he goes. Uh, the gospel begins, and he went into the region of Caesarea Philippi. If we remember from last week, oh, I wasn't. Was I here last week? No, I wasn't here last week. But, and then that's when my recorder broke. So if you did listen to it, the, uh, the sound wasn't all that good. I recorded it on my phone. But um, the, uh, uh, I preached on it a little bit, but, and we have, this, we have this clear-cut understanding that just right before this in Matthew 16, Jesus goes and he, he um, 
verse, in, in 15, verse 21, what we heard last week, then Jesus went from that place and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. If you're at my Masses last week, that's really what I, I, I pointed to. Why is Jesus leaving Jerusalem? He's leaving his people. He's going into pagan territory. He's going into pagan land. So Jesus still, he's left Jerusalem, and he's going up the coast. All of our Bibles have little maps in the back if you really want to look at it. But he's going up the coast out of Tyre and Sidon, and he's even further north into Caesarea Philippi. What significance does that have? It is. It, ha it, 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 it tells us something. If we've, anyone ever been to the Holy Land? Just our two superstars here. All right, we'll, go, we'll get there eventually. So if, if, if you go to the Holy Land, everyone goes to Caesarea Philippi. And um, it, it's named after, you know, there's some, there's some um, discrepancy, you know, historical discrepancy about, about all, of the, uh, all of the names. But it's, a, it's an area, it's a land, it's a region that has changed ownership, that has changed authority over millennia a lot, quite a bit. That's where the Jews were established? That's, uh, in Caesarea Philippi. I, you know, so there was a lot of pagan deities, there was a lot of pagan land there. They worshiped the, the god Pan, um, which I don't know much about all of those kinds. So there was a lot of pagan worship in the land. It, yeah, I'm sorry. The Phoenicians, yeah, so honestly, I'm not too sure with all of the historical stuff of it. I do know that it, it becomes jurisdiction of the Roman Empire, and Rome obviously begins to occupy Galilee and, and Jerusalem. So Rome, during Jesus' time, it is an occupied land by the Roman Empire. At a certain point, they name it Caesarea in honor of King Caesar or Caesar Augustus or whatever, you know, the, the Roman emperor. So they, they name it after him. Herod, the tetrarch of the area, they, they had, you know, kind of like governors and jurisdictions. He dies and, one, uh, and, and he split his empire up to his four sons, one of, kind of in quadrants, if you will, one of his sons was named Philip. So it becomes Caesarea Philippi, and it was a high type of, it was, it was a mountainous area, so it was very strategic, and it was considered a, a, an important area. That's why it changed hands so many times. And if you go there, you cannot, you can't blast the image or the memory out of your brain because it's just kind of like a, a super cool mountainous area that's just super rocky. It's just rocks with some caves, and it's really cool, and it's really pretty and just kind of pagany. But I mean, there's, there might, that, I mean, there's a church there now, but it's still very like just a mountain and kind of rocky and pagany. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, so it's, it's this giant rock formation that you could even imagine like, you know, I call it, we call it Mount Trashmore, it was just on Lapeer. Just imagine it just being a huge rock. So that's where Jesus takes them, okay? And he asks them in the backdrop of this giant rock, and he says, who do people say that I am? Why is he bringing them there? We'll try to get to that here in a second. So, he's, so, he, so he asks them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The Son of Man. And we've heard that prophecy all of the time, uh, or that, that, that declaration. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man more often than anything else throughout the scriptures. And it's fulfilled, it's found in Daniel chapter 7. We can't go into it. Your homework is, if you want to really understand that prophecy, read Daniel chapter 7 today. Uh, but it's not the same uh, as the Son of God. <coughs> Some people would say that you know, Jesus uses these, these terms you know, kind of uh, interchangeably. There, it's not so much. He uses this image uh, to fulfill the prophecy from Daniel. And so Peter steps up and he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After, after 
all these dudes, all of the apostles answering correctly. Some say you're, you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, Jeremiah, or some other prophet. And Peter steps up. And so here the, 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 the Protestant argument is, is, that, um, is that Jesus is declaring not St. Peter as the rock, but they're declaring St. Peter's faith as the rock. That Jesus isn't building the church upon Peter himself, but upon Peter's declaration, okay? That his statement, that it was his, his confession, his statement, um, you know, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Peter's statement or confession that Jesus responds to. Um, he, Jesus says, says to him in reply, verse 18, Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Barjona, Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. So, 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 so he's, building, he's building something upon St. Peter. And we're going to come to hopefully see that. So what rock, right? So upon this rock. So this is the backdrop. So Jesus takes them out there in the middle of the wilderness upon this military strategic rock formation in pagan land in the backdrop of this big old rock. And he's not just like saying, oh, Peter, shucks. You know, you're a chip off the old block. He answered right. You know, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. No. He builds them, you know, so some people would say, you know, he's doing this, he's doing this, uh, you know, uh, geographically. Jesus brings them here geographically. We would say that Jesus is doing this spiritually. He's entering into pagan territory as we, as we uh, addressed last week, that, that Jesus is going to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Not Jew only, but Jew first and then the Gentiles. So he's He's proclaiming his church to be built upon solid rock, upon Peter, upon the, his faith, sure, but upon him so that he can go into the Gentiles, right? But it's not, you know, some, some scholars will say, oh, he just, he brought him out there just to point to this rock formation. It was to show the complete opposite, that I'm not building my church on the foundation of, of the world, but upon you. So Jesus is doing two very very important things here. He's building his church and he's establishing and he's showing authority. Okay? Building his church and he's establishing his authority. So, the word rock and, and rocks uh, have, been, have been used all throughout Scripture. Used as a sign and an image of, of protection, metaphorically, spiritually, nourishing and the rock followed them through the desert. St. Paul then in, um, I believe it's Corinthians, he says, he says, and the rock followed them through the desert, and the rock was Christ. Okay? So it's used metaphorically all throughout. Grab your, your trusty hand out here. On the, uh, the, there is no front side or back side. On the Isaiah side, at the very bottom, it says rock in the Old Testament. See that? In the Psalms, uh, in the Psalms, God is, is referred to as a rock. We read, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Right? So God is referred to as a rock. Then the prophet Isaiah records Abraham as a rock. Hearken to me. I'm sorry, for those who are listening at home, that was, uh, that was Psalm 95, verse 1. And then uh, the prophet Isaiah records Abraham as a rock. Hearken to me, you who pursue de deliverance, you, sh you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For when he was but, for when he was but one, I called him, and I and I blessed him and made him many. Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2. And so, so Jesus, and for Jesus to call Peter the rock is consistent with the Old Testament, where the prophet Isaiah told Israel to look to Abraham the rock. 
Jesus is basically saying that Peter will be known as a rock just as Abraham and, and God and Yahweh. So it's interesting. So look, it's in, Jesus or we establish from the Old Testament, I guess we could say even more so, that, that it's not just God. <clears throat> it's not just God who's known as the rock. It's not just God who is identified as, 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 as rock. It's humans as well, Abraham and Sarah as well. And so the rock meant something to the Jews. Right? Again, the rock follows them through the desert, and the rock was Christ. But the Jews of the Old Testament had a special understanding for the rock. Flip back to Genesis 22. We're not going to read it, but it's good just to see the header. If you want to read Genesis 22, you can go back to it. Genesis 22. So Genesis 22 is the testing of Abraham. How does, how does, God get, how does uh, Abraham get tested? How does God test Abraham? Do we remember? With Isaac. Sacrificing Isaac. That's right, sacrificing Isaac. So God asks Isaac, uh, asks Abraham to take his son Isaac, take him up on top of the mountain. Isaac carries the wood, remember? Symbol of Jesus carrying his cross. He goes up on top of a mountain. God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. So, the, the, the tradition has always been that Isaac laid the, the, the wood down upon a rock. We read that here in, 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 uh, in Genesis 22. Lies down the wood upon a rock and Abraham straps him there. And so Solomon builds the temple. He builds the temple of God's sacrifice over that rock of Abraham on Mount Moriah in which Isaac laid down. And so that's the rock of Mount Moriah. If we've ever been to the Holy Land, what's on top of the temple now, the, the rock of Mount Moriah? The Muslim, the Muslim temple, the Golden Dome. If we've seen pictures of, uh, of, of the Holy Land, we can't not but see the Golden Dome. And what, what's, the, what's the name of the temple? What's the name of the, 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 uh, the mosque? The Dome of the Rock. They too identify that the rock of Abraham of Mount Moriah is there. And they believe that it was Ishmael that Abraham sacrificed, not Isaac. They were, they, the Ishmaelites, the, 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 the child of Hagar, the, the, the mistress of Abraham, was sent off into the desert, the Ishmaelites. God promised that, that all of Abraham's generations would multiply. The Islam, Muslims trace their lineage back to the Ishmaelites. And so Ishmael, they believe, they say that it was, it was Ishmael who was offered on the rock, not Isaac. And so nonetheless, don't wanna to get too far off, off of the beaten path, but that rock, is sacred to Judaism and to Islam as well, but it's sacred, okay, the, the, that rock. It is also believed in, in Judaism that at the parting of the Red Sea, that it was that rock that first rose up. And so the Jews took that rock with them, and, uh, and it is the very stone in which Abraham offers Isaac. So it's the rock. Yeah, so, so it's obviously not scriptural. It's part of the, the Jewish midrash. It's just part of the, their teaching, their understanding, their tradition, just that it, it was the first thing on the bottom of the sea that the Jews it bubbled up and they took it with them. And maybe that's the rock that followed them that gave water. You know, So, I mean, that's lost to tradition and that, that's just been the constant tradition, teaching of of Judaism. So Jesus says, I, I'm back in Matthew now, um, I can't get the verse here, but Jesus says, he says to Peter, he says, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of hell, the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. So the Jews believed 
that after Solomon, as Solomon builds the temple over the rock of Mount Moriah, over the rock of sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac, the Jews believe that this rock blocked the works of hell. It blocked the very passageway of Hades. So how cool is that? So, so, so the temple stood there as a means to keep hell out and to offer the sacrifice of God and that the rock was there in place to keep the entranceway of Hades closed. So Solomon is called a wise builder in Scripture and Jesus declares himself, there is something greater than Solomon here. There is something greater than the temple here. Remember that story? And so Jesus is building a new temple. He's building a new church. He's building a new temple upon a new rock. He's building a new church upon this rock. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so trust me when I say this, this is not lost on the Jews. This isn't lost on them when he says this. So Jesus will build a new temple, a new church upon, upon a new rock, which is Peter, and the gates will not prevail against it. Doesn't the meaning of Peter require rock? I'm sorry? The meaning of Peter and the word rock, aren't they somewhat interchangeable? Yes. Um, so so he, he changes... Yeah, so he, so Jesus changes the name of Peter. He changes his name, and that's significant, and that's a whole nother line uh, of, of thought. You know, so, so he changes the name of Peter, of Simon to Peter, Kephas in, in Aramaic, and Petros in, in Greek, and it means rock. And, and so he changes his name, and so now he will be called rock. Peter, Petros, Petros, and Kephas in Aramaic. So that, that name change is significant. God changes the name. We'll get to this in a second here. God changes the name of, of Isaac, um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He changes the name of Jacob to Israel. He changes the name of Abram to Abraham, uh, Sarah to, uh, Sarai to Sarah. And, and he changes names to signify the change of heart but also a new, a new command that you are, you are a new Saul to Paul to change, you, know, you have a new, a new identity. So, so there's this prophecy in, in, so you got two homework assignments, Daniel chapter seven and Daniel chapter two. So the prophecy in, Jan, in Daniel two, um, so we're gonna, let me get it right there, yep. So, on the back side there, Daniel's dream. Okay. So, Daniel's dream in the bottom, the bottom paragraph right there. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, so Daniel's, Daniel has a dream. So Daniel is brought in to interpret dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so in, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel interprets, interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, as I just said that. Uh, which he spoke of a small stone breaking the powerful kingdoms of the world. A statue with the head of gold, shoulders of silver and body of bronze and feet of iron mixed with clay. These represent the four kingdoms that would come. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. Then Daniel saw a small stone coming and striking the statue in the head, crushing the entire statue. And so this small stone grows and grows until it becomes a mighty mountain covering the world. And so this stone is the kingdom of God. And so Jesus' statement to Peter is fulfillment of, of, of Daniel chapter 2. It grows and grows. And so the church, again, this is why Jesus brings them out into Caesarea Philippi. The church grows and grows to, to encompass and to destroy by conversion, all of these pagan lands. And so it's, a, it's another fulfillment and, and issuance of, of the rock. On to the keys.
first is the gate. Hell is trying to get in. And if we look at a Protestant translation of the Bible, it kind of goes along that line. Upon this church I will build, or upon this rock I will build my church, and all the power of, of hell will not conquer it. So that's hell trying to get in. But then I heard that our translation, it's actually, it's, we're trying to, we're breaking through the gates of hell. Like, the, the gates are not the church. The, mm -hmm. gates are the, hell, the gates of hell, right? And the church is just busting through them like they're not even there. Mm -hmm. Which is, one is passive, right? Hell's trying to get in. The mm -hmm. other is active as the church is. More like what Daniel was saying, right? It's a small stone that's obliterating yeah. hell and the gates of hell. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so it is, it is such an interesting, uh, it's an interesting translation. It's an interesting thing to, to look at with the, um, you know, with, with that phrase of the, the gates of hell and, um, you know, so yeah, right. So, um, swords are, are, uh, the gates of hell, swords are, are offensive. It's just, if it said the swords of hell shall not prevail against you, I get that, right? They're, God is saying he will, he will protect us. Um, or the, the bazookas of hell shall not prevail against you. I get that, right? God's going to protect us. But, but he's saying, you know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And so, so you know, I... I would, I would think of it as, yeah, we're going to get to just a little bit just about, about, what, um, about how the church is meant to operate. But um, so, the, so the church is on the offensive and not just the defensive. And if we, if we believe that the rock, as, as the Jews did, covered up the entrance into Hades, then it is the church that still covers the, the, uh, the, the dark entrance of Hades. And if you know any, and so I'm getting way off cue here, but um, I think even Indiana, I mentioned Indiana Jones two weeks in a row now, uh, Indiana Jones uh, in the temple, uh, I think it's the Temple of Duner at Lost Crusade with the Nazis, that so that's very factual. Hitler and one of his other uh, Grobels or some of the other guys, they were tr were very much into the occult and they were looking for the entrance into hell, and they wanted to tap into into that those forces. Yeah. So now. Um, I think I think there there's a lot there's a lot to be said just about that that translation of, of gates. Keys. Keys. So keys refer to an office, right? If I give you if I give you my house keys, I'm I'm trusting you and I'm gonna say, okay, I'm I'm giving my keys to you. You have you have some type of 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 preference. And so they refer to an offerance, they refer to, uh, to authority, they uh, refer to trust. And so both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, keys come up. And there is this, there is this title in Isaiah that we, that we read earlier, okay? So we read uh, in, in, um, in the first reading, we read Isaiah 22, 19 through 23, okay? So we're going to read it again here. And, um, and so in that, the keys are given, okay? So I'm going to read off the sheet here. Everyone got the sheet just so that we can kind of get a, a fuller picture of it. Okay, this is Isaiah 22, 15 through 25. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to the stewards, to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, what have you to do here, and whom have you here that you have hewn, from, he, hewn here a tomb for yourself? You who hew a tomb on the height and carve a habitation for yourself in the rock. And so now this picks up here. Behold the Lord, I will hurl you violently 
O oh, you strong man, he will seize firm hold on you and whirl you around, around and throw you into a bowl wide of land. There you shall die. There you shall. That's not the same reading, is it? No, that's not the same reading. Jeff Caven screwed that up. We're just going to read from uh, the reading from the reading from uh, our uh, from Sunday. Thus says the Lord to Shebna, master of the palace. Oh, no, it is. I'm sorry. Just different translation. I will thrust you from your office and pull you down from your station. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him, okay, I will clothe him with your robe and gird him with your sash and give him over to your authority. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of the house of Judah. I will place the key keys of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. When he, does, when, he, when he opens, no one shall shut. When he shuts, no one shall open. I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. That's, I'm sorry that I got a little confused with that reading up there. It was just kind of an odd translation. So, so what's happening here is Shebna is being cast out and Eliakim of the house of David in Eliakim is being placed in a prominent position. Shebna held the office of prime minister in the Jewish court. And the Hebrew word for that is al hat bayit al hat bayit It means prime minister. Shebna is being cast out and Eliakim is being placed there. I will give him your robe, gird him with your stash, give him over to give him over to your authority. And so, um, so the 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 role of the Al Hat Bayit was that role of the prime minister. When the king was away, the Al Hat Bayit took over. That's the role of the prime minister. So that was a that was. In the, in the Jewish authority. If the king is away, then, um, then, then the prime minister is in charge. We see that he's called father, papa. That's where we get the word pope. Sound familiar? That, that we place the keys upon his shoulder. So he's given the keys of the al Hat Bayit. He's given the keys in the authority of David. And no one shall open. Continuing on, we had a question. I'm going to continue on here. I was thinking, as far as giving authority, I was thinking of uh, the Haman thing where in one day, you know, there's one owl, they see the split. How Haman was going to be thrown on the gallows and then it was like quick. Right. He was, you know, the king, you know, escalated it all to blood. But the fact that God could trigger him for a day and a half, I think he even mentioned it here, God knows a day and a half. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so he's telling a story about how Haman sought to kill the Jews, right? And, and, uh, and then Esther intercedes, and, you know, God, God redeems his people. Yeah, just, just in an, in a, in an instant like that. Yeah. So the keys, we're, on, we're thinking about the keys here. So the keys show authority, okay? So the 12 tribes of Israel, anyone, can anyone name the 12 tribes of Israel? All right. Reuben, Simeon. Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Okay, so the kingdom of Israel, so the, so the, uh, the kingdom of Israel is, is the important understanding of the keys here. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the patriarchs of old. So Jacob is renamed Israel. He has, Jacob has 12 sons, remember? Israel has 12 sons, the sons of the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. They, 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 they're, um, they want, you know, they want a kingdom. They go into Egypt, they're there for, you know, 400 years, 
they remain, you know, you know, their own, you know, their own people. Then they, then they, they, after, you know, after the exodus and all of that, they, they begin to disperse. They, they go all over the place. David is named king. Remember the story? Uh, um, um, Jesse, son of Jesse, Samuel, the prophet, comes to David. He anoint, He says, bring all of your sons out here, Jesse. Not that one, not that one, not that one. Now, there's the king, King David. Anoints King David as king. D, uh, David, and, and so the word anointed one means meshach, uh, Christos. So David is named the anointed one. And what is David's great claim? He unites all of the tribes of Israel together. The keys of David, the keys of the kingdom of David. So David unites the tribes together, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the anointed one who brings them together. David has a son, Solomon, with Bathsheba, remember? Solomon builds the temple upon the rock. He's the great builder of the temple. David's son, uh, David's, uh, I'm sorry, Solomon's uh, a good king, bad king, good king, bad king, does good things, does bad things, has a lot of concubines, allows pagan worship. His son watches that, and then his son goes wayward, and all of the other kings go wayward. What happens with the kingdoms? What happens with the nations of Israel? They begin to fight among themselves, and then they divide. Ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. The two tribes in the south are Judah and Benjamin. That's important. We call, we call them Jews because they're from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, right? Benjamin's just kind of tagging along. He's like, hey, man, I'm going with you. <laughs> and so they settle in Jerusalem, okay? So the Assyrians, I'm giving you 6,000 years of Jewish history in 32 seconds. So then Assyria comes in and wipes out all of the kingdoms, all of the nations, all of the, the kingdoms of uh, all of the, the, the people of Israel in the north. The ten lost tribes of Israel, they are completely obliterated to human history. There is no remembrance of them. They are not alive. They're completely decimated. Okay, so Judah and Benjamin in the south remain. They remain. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4. I think it's Matthew chapter 4. I should, um, that's why I pulled out my phone to try to look it up real quick and see if my memory serves me. Matthew chapter 4. I gotta find it first. Yeah, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Ding, 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 ding. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. So the beginning of his Galilean ministry. So Jesus, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of who? Who are they? Tribes of the lost tribes of Israel. And that what had, had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way to the sea by, by, beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness have seen a great light, and those dwelling in the land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. So Jesus comes and he begins his ministry in the land of the forsaken ten lost tribes of Israel. He comes to save us, but he comes through particular means. Just like last week, how I pointed out and went into, you know, in my, in my homily, if you're here on Sunday, if we cross paths, how he points out the very specific reason why he's going into Tyre and Sidon. Because he's, he's coming first for the Jews, but the, the church, the rock, the new temple is to save the Gentiles as well. And so these are the people that killed his own. 
And he's going to begin his very ministry there, there to restore the old by reestablishing a new kingdom and a new, a new, a new tribes. So Jesus goes to Zebulun and Naphtali. He's there to restore and reestablish the kingdom of Israel, to restore the tribes of God. And he begins in the north. And so what does he do? So we just read 12 through 16. So then what is verse 17, 18? As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Andrew and Simon, and then James and John. So he calls two, and there's another two. Let's call Levi the tax collector. And does he get 52? No, he gets 12. He calls 12. And so Jesus is clearly establishing a new kingdom. In the Old Kingdom, there, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament, there was a kingdom. In the New Testament, there's a kingdom. In the Old, there was a prime minister. And in the New, there's a prime minister. And so the keys are possessed by the prime minister. When the king is away, he, has, he, he gives his authority to the prime minister. Isaiah 22, the keys, taking, uh, taking authority away from, uh, uh, away from, oh, jeepers, I'm going to close my book, taking uh, authority away from Shebna, and Eliakim has the authority now. It's given to him, and the keys are set upon his shoulder. And so Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, he gives these exact words to Peter. He gives Peter authority and makes him the Al-Habi, the al Bayit. So he makes him the prime minister. He gives him this authority. And so all the apostles are like, I get what just happened. I see what has just happened. So Jesus came, comes to save us but he came to establish a kingdom. He came to establish a church. And so we didn't make this up. So that, we didn't make it up. It's here, Isaiah 22, that first reading. The prime minister has an office. He's clothed with a robe. He wears a sash of authority. He's referred to as father, as papa. He has the keys of David. He's able to bind and loose. He's fastened like a peg. I love that, I love that line. He's, uh, where is it at here? Um, I will, the very last sentence, I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot. What does it mean? It means he's unmovable. Not, not, not his, his, his body, but it means the teaching authority, right? We teach with authority. You can't sway me on, on faith and morals. You can't sway me with my teaching. I'm fixed with a sure peg. That he has a throne of honor and the weight of the Father's house is hung upon him. So when Jesus establishes his kingdom, the question is, is who's going to be the prime minister of the kingdom? And it's, it's blatantly obvious, the one who has the keys. And who's the prime minister of the new covenant? It's Peter. And so for 266 consecutive popes, uh, they've been entrusted with running the kingdom while Jesus is away. So the question that always comes up, as I was asked at the earlier 12 noon Bible study, the question that always comes up is, well, what about bad popes? You know, there, there, have, been, there have been some really evil tyrants and, and, had, uh, and had, you know, fathered children and um, been awful, awful people. And, you know, and, and it's, it's true, you know, I don't know all of the stories of the anti-popes. I don't, I don't know all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure it's fascinating to get into. It's just, I don't have time, nor do I want to explore that. But, but the truth of the matter is that, that there ha we've been blessed in the last 100 years or so from some really saintly popes. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, ha we, have the, we have the understanding, the teaching, the understanding that, that the pope is infallible when teaching faith or morals. And he teaches, as we would say, ex cathedra from the chair of St. Peter. And, and so all of those tyrant popes, any, any immorality or evil that may have, may have come from the office of St. Peter, none of the 260 have ever taught heresy. They've never taught that Jesus wasn't divine. Um, and 
you know, should that ever happen? Please, God, not, right? He's not the Pope of a foot. He's not the Pope of Rome. And, you know, we can argue until cows come home, but, um, but, you know, uh, when we are in the bark of Christ, it's called, you know, in, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the boat of, of St. Peter, we are in, we are in the, the lifeblood of God. And so that's our, that's our hope. And I would just uh, say that, you know, no pope can change the sacraments of the Eucharist or anything like that. So no pope can change the sacraments of the Eucharist, he said. Yeah, so if, if anything were to happen, we still have the sacraments. And that would make it true. Amen. We would still have the sacraments. Thoughts, comments, questions? Pretty. I'm looking, I'm looking at the firm and the Tiberius and all those things. Yeah, if you, it, it'd probably be a. Yeah, so, um, so if you can see Jerusalem, that's, that's Judah. Yeah, if you can see Jerusalem, that's Judah. So look at this. I just I just opened up a sweet map right here, right? So here here's the land of Zebulun and Naphtali right here. Okay. Asher. So here is Judah and Benjamin. Okay, yeah. So you're not even up, you know, you're up around the yep. western side of Sea of Galilee here. Yeah. So Capernaum where it says that Jesus established his home was in I would say in that, sa in that same region, yeah. yeah. So where Jesus was. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.